Good morning, everybody. Welcome to this press conference on banking supervision. Let me introduce our main speakers, who you know, of course, uh, this is the chair of the supervisory board, Danielle Nui, and to her right, um, the vice chair, Sabine Lautenschläger. They will both make brief introductory remarks. Um, we're holding this press conference today on the occasion of the release of the annual report on supervisory activities, which covers our first full year of operations. As you know, the report was presented yesterday to the European Parliament by Ms. Nuyi, who was in Brussels for that occasion. She will say a few words on behalf of all of us on the events that happened there yesterday before we go into the introductory statements. Danielle, please. Thank you, Connie. Good morning, everybody. Uh, let me take this opportunity to express our deep uh, sympathy to the victims and their families of the tragic uh, events uh, yesterday morning in Brussels. I speak uh, on behalf of all of us when I say that uh, we feel uh, great sorrow and also great solidarity with the people of Brussels and Belgium. Such uh, events remind us uh, how important it is to stand together in Europe. Our thoughts are with the victims and their families. With that, let me return to my uh, preparatory uh, preliminary statement and welcome you to our uh, press conference on the ECB annual report on supervisory activities for 2015. Having already presented the report at the European Parliament in Brussels yesterday, I would like to take the opportunity today to look beyond the annual report on beyond 2015. Early this year, the banking sector took center stage when volatility increased and bank share prices dropped. In that line, I find it reassuring that European banks have become much more resilient over the past few years by significantly increasing their capital ratios. Since 2012, the CET1 ratio, for instance, has moved from 9% to 13%. Still, the recent episode of volatility revealed uncertainty on the part of investors, not necessarily with regard to banks' resilience, but rather to banks' profitability. Against the backdrop of a continuing period of low interest rates, a weakening global economy, ailing emerging markets, and plunging oil prices. Many investors worry about the ability of banks to adjust their business model and sustain their profitability. We too see uh, the adjustment of business models as the biggest challenge of the European banking sector. Other challenges include credit risk on heightened levels of non-performing loans, a reversal of the search for yield, conduct on governance risk, sovereign risk, geopolitical risk, growing vulnerabilities in emerging economies, as well as IT and cybercrime. Based on this risk, we have defined five priorities that will guide our supervisory work in 2016. First, we will look at banks' business models and profitability. Second, we will look at credit risk, particularly with regard to non-performing loans. In that connection, we established a dedicated working group last year, which had been tasked with supporting a reduction in the stocks of non-performing loans. Third, we will look at capital adequacy, for example, with regard to bailing capital. Fourth, we will look at risk management and governance. Given the current environment of very low interest rates and abundant liquidity, it is increasingly important that banks manage their risk appropriately. On fifth, we will look at liquidity. That said, I'm certain that banks would add another challenge, namely the need to cope with many changes in the regulatory framework. Yes, there have been a number of changes, and yes, efforts are required in adapting to them. We understand that, and we strive for regulatory certainty in order to enable banks to plan accordingly and address risk appropriately. Nevertheless, we should not forget where we have come from, namely a fragmented banking sector in Europe on a global financial crisis. Against that backdrop, regulatory reform was necessary. Uh, what has been done had to be done. The new capital and liquidity requirements have increased the resilience of individual banks and of the entire banking system. 
Systemically, uh, we are in a much stronger position than we uh, were before the last crisis. Wherever the next storm blows in from, banks will be more resilient. And if a bank does fail, the new bailing rules will protect taxpayers. That in turn realigns incentives for investors. The increase in spreads for certain capital instruments is a sign that markets are adjusting to these new rules. Moreover, Basel III, the centerpiece of regulatory reform, is about to be finalized in 2016. There will be no significant further increase in capital requirement. And we are not discussing uh, Basel IV. The regulatory reform is coming to an end. It has uh, paved the way towards a more stable banking system. Granted, it has been a long journey and not an easy one. The crisis has undermined confidence in banks, and it will take time to, on effort to fully restore it. The recent outburst of volatility uh, was a case in point. We as supervisors contribute together with regulators to restoring confidence in the banking system, but the banks themselves need to make sure they have viable business models, and the banks themselves have to manage their risk prudently. Acknowledging this and acting accordingly is another necessary step towards the objective of a stable banking system that serves the real economy. Thank you for your attention. Ladies and gentlemen, I also welcome you to our uh, first press conference. Uh, Danielle Nui has just pointed at the regulatory reforms as a source of change for the banking system. Nevertheless, there has been another reform uh, that brought about major change. I'm, of course, um, talking about European banking supervision. And uh, bringing banking supervision to a European level was just as necessary as regulatory reform. And like regulatory reform, it will help to restore confidence in the banking system. What are the actual benefits of European banking supervision? First, European banking supervision does not stop at national borders, but takes a European perspective. And if I may say so, sometimes it's advantageous, advantageous uh, when you are a little bit more distant um, in your decision making. It can therefore compare and benchmark banks across borders in order to identify problems early on. Second, European banking supervision combines the experience and the expertise of 19 national supervisors and the ECP can therefore draw on a huge pool of analytical power. Third, European banking supervision can act when action is called for. Ultimately, European banking supervision ensures that banks across the entire euro area are being supervised according to the same high standards within the scope of national legislation. In 2015, we took important steps in that direction. For instance, with regard to our main instrument of banking supervision, the supervisory review and evaluation process, or SREP for short. Capital requirements based on a risk-based and forward-looking analysis and embedded in SREP are essential in safeguarding the stability of the financial system. In 2015, the SREP was for the first time ever conducted according to a harmonized methodology. Banks across the euro area were measured against a common yardstick. Consequently, we now observe a stronger correlation between the risk profile of the institutions and the relevant supervisory capital requirements. In 2016, we will further refine the SREP. In that context, we asked for clarification regarding the legal underpinnings of SREP and received the European Commission's internal discussion paper for comments. We welcome the Commission's objective of creating regulatory certainty, as this is crucial for both banks and markets. In 2016, the SREP will be supplemented by two stress tests. And EU-wide stress test conducted by the European Banking Authority, the EBA, 
and a Eurowide stress test conducted by the ECB. The SSM will hence be able to assess all significant institutions in the euro area from a forward-looking perspective. For both stress tests, the provisions of the EBA's methodology will be relevant. The insights gained from the EBA and the ECB stress test will feed into the 2016 SREP, and it's therefore not a pass or fail exercise. Moreover, any data quality and quality assurance issue that come to light during the exercise will also be incorporated in the 2016 SREP for the institutions concerned. European regulation offers a large number of provisions which give supervisors some leeway in deciding on their concrete implementation. When we agreed on exercising these options and discretions in a harmonized manner across the entire euro area in 2015, we took another step towards harmonizing banking supervision. The relevant regulation and the guide will enter into force in October 2016, so this year. To sum up, during the full year of European banking supervision, we have accomplished much towards the harmonization of banking supervision across the euro area. But there's still a lot of work ahead of us. We are, for instance, preparing a targeted review of banks' internal models. The background for our review is that many significant institutions use internal models to determine regulatory capital requirements. Our review seeks to reduce the non-risk-based variability in model-based capital requirements. Ladies and gentlemen, in our statement today, we have so far focused on the significant institutions, those banks that are directly supervised by the ECB. However, we must not forget the around 3,200 less significant institutions, or LSIs called. In many countries, those small and medium-sized banks are highly important for the regional and national economy. And as the group, and as a group, they can be also relevant for national financial stability. Those banks are directly supervised by the National Competent Authority, and it is not our ambition to change this and directly supervise them. Rather, the SSM exercises oversight over the overall functioning of the system. And together with the National Supervisor, we are developing common supervisory standards which take into account regional aspects as well as the size, business activities, and risk profiles of individual institutions. Accordingly, we have agreed with the national supervisors on, for instance, a joint standard on supervisory planning for LSIs. This standard enables the national supervisors to define supervisory priorities for their LSIs according to a common methodology. In the same vein, we have recently agreed on a joint supervisory standard on recovery planning for LSIs. And we are looking into institutional protection schemes, which are particularly relevant for less significant institutions. Under European law, banks may be granted certain privileges regarding capital liquidity requirements, regarding large exposure rules, if they belong to a protection scheme. Given our objective of harmonization of level playing field, there is much to be said for granting these privileges in accordance with uniform criteria. We have now defined the relevant criteria and are currently conducting a public consultation that will run until mid-April. In brief, while regulatory reform is coming to an end, we are still refining the methods and processes of supervision. Ultimately, we will have created a strong supervisory framework which contributes to the safety and soundness of the banking system with full regard and duty of care for the unity and integrity of the internal market. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. We will come to questions now. Please, clear down. 
Claire Jones, Financial Times. Um, there's been a lot of criticism from some of the banks that you supervise of negative interest rates with quite a few senior bankers saying it's forcing them to take on too much risk. Now, Ms. Noy, you mentioned in your opening statement that it's very important that banks can manage their risks appropriately. Does this mean that you agree with banks' concerns that your colleagues on the Governing Council are pushing banks to take on too much risk? And it may be good for you to talk a little bit about whether some of the new measures such as um, Teltro's address some of those risks that you see to bank profitability. Um, I'd also like to ask about sovereign risk weights. Um, now, you've criticised in the past the zero risk rates on... Um, sovereign assets. Um, now, the Basel Committee is reviewing this. What are you doing to ensure that this committee comes out with what you believe is the right outcome on this issue? Thank you very much uh, for, for the questions. Uh, indeed, the profitability uh, of the banks uh, is challenged uh, nowadays, but uh, there are uh, two main reasons for that, uh, the level of interest rate, for sure, but also the, the level of non-performing exposures. Uh, such uh, challenging times are also good opportunities uh, for the banks uh, to review their business model, reassess the sustainability of their business models. Uh, and I believe uh, they have uh, room for maneuvering. If we look, uh, for example, at uh, cost to income ratios of the European banks, they are uh, pretty high. So they could go down uh, and the banks could be more efficient and some uh, are already working, many are already working uh, on this efficiency. Also, uh, digitalization is uh, a new uh, possibility uh, for, for the banks. There are many customers that uh, would like to uh, uh, receive banking services through uh, digitalization. And this is also helping to be uh, more efficient, to have uh, lower uh, cost to income uh, ratios. So challenges, but uh, also uh, opportunities. Do you want to add something, Sabine, on this? Well, I think banks um, need to cope with the macroeconomic environment they find. Yeah? We had um, several times in the 50, last 50 years in an interest environment where the real interest rate was uh, negative. Yeah? Um, and I, I do believe that, um, yes, there is a challenge with regard to the low interest rate, environment. Um, do not forget on the other side, and you mentioned that already with the TLTRO, um, that there are uh, some gains with regard to the funding cost uh, too. Yeah? So it is a challenging environment, um, but it was a challenging environment already before because, and here I, I totally agree um, with Danielle, we need to have viable business models in banks which can cope not only with the macroeconomic environment when there is a low interest rate, but which can cope with uh, competition you know, from um, the digitalization yeah, um, uh, coming, uh, with competition from the shadow banking market, with regard to the regulatory reforms which put a burden uh, on banks. So there are many, many issues on the table uh, which calls for um, amending business models in, in some of the banks uh, we supervise. So I wouldn't pick out the low interest rate environment um, uh, in particular. And regarding uh, sovereign risk, uh, let me say that I am uh, happy that uh, this issue is now uh, addressed. It is addressed at international level uh, within the Basel Committee, and it is also addressed uh, in, uh, at the European level. Uh, uh, the progress are, uh, are good. Uh, there is uh, also now an hybrid approach which is discussed where the risk-weighted asset could be uh, dependent on the uh, concentration uh, and on the, the quality of the sovereigns. Uh, I think good work is being done, so uh, something uh, reasonable will uh, come uh, out of this uh, work and discussions. Next questions? Yes, please. Front here. Yes. Thank you. Tom Fellows from the Wall Street Journal. 
Um, you mentioned the flexibility um, in terms of interpreting some of the regulations coming from Brussels. Um, at the end of his last news conference, Mr Draghi referenced an internal commission document on how to interpret um, some of the capital requirements. Um, I, I guess the question was, is there any difference between the SSM and Mr Draghi on how to interpret the Pillar 2 requirements for banks? Um, my second question was, in terms of the Greek banking sector, are there any particular changes? What are your priorities there? What, are there any particular changes that you're trying to see implemented in the, in the coming year? Thanks. Well, I, I doubt very much that there are uh, differences between uh, the, the president and uh, the SSM. Uh, also, I had no chance to discuss it uh, <laughs> with the, the, the president yet because it came uh, late the, uh, on recently, this uh, clarification from the commission. Let me say first that we ask for this clarification uh, from the, the, the commission. Uh, clarification, certainty, uh, harmonization are a very important concept for us. Uh, in order to uh, do uh, harmonize the supervision in the SSM and in Europe, we need to have harmonized regulation, and the regulation is unclear. Uh, so we ask for the clarification. We have uh, received uh, recently this clarification, which is uh, welcome. And we are working on uh, this document to see uh, how best use this clarification that has uh, uh, come from the, the, the Commission. I know the, the word of flexibility to implement the regulation was employed in the report of the Econ Committee on Banking Union. Uh, it's not uh, that easy uh, for supervisors to be flexible with law. I would not recommend that uh, supervisors to be flexible with law. We just want to implement uh, the, the law, so I am very uh, happy that the clarification, the flexibility uh, is coming from the persons uh, in charge of uh, interpreting the, the law, uh, namely the Commission. There was a second part of the question Greek on the Greek, Greek banking sector. Well, I, 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 do have, I do have a problem um, to order banks in countries. Yeah? We have a European perspective here. Uh, so we are, as a banking supervisor, looking at banks in a very institution-specific uh, way. And each bank has its peculiarities and need to be supervised individually and aligned with its risk profile, its business model. So for me um, to say there are the German banks or there are the Dutch ones or there are the Greek ones, um, I have a problem uh, with this concept. When you talk about the overall status with regard to Greece, I think it is very important um, that um, uh, they, they come out at the right time, when the conditions are fulfilled, out of their uh, capital uh, control uh, measures, um, uh, that the banks go into a usual you know, business again with regard to their ca the capital control measures when, th when they are lifted. Um, we, we did, I think, um, a great job with regard to the comprehensive assessment, ensuring um, uh, that uh, the banks have enough capital uh, for the upcoming years in order to cope even with an adverse scenario, an adverse development. And um, I believe um, uh, with the rest, it is just very, very important that the macroeconomic environment in Greece you know, um, um, aligns um, uh, the capital uh, control measures are lifted when, it, uh, when they are ready, um, and, and then we will see what happens with the single banks. Would you like to compliment? Well, I, I fully agree. The, the Greek banks were hit by something that had nothing to do with their own uh, situation. Uh, it was a, a stress, a very violent stress, more uh, violent and brutal than a supervisor's adverse scenario. Uh, they went through, uh, now they are recovering from this episode, uh, and I am uh, pretty certain, uh, like uh, Sabine said, that uh, when they are out of uh, exchange control, thanks to the progress of the country, uh, they, they, they will be able to uh, do the, 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 the job of funding the economy uh, that needs it uh, in Greece, just like uh, other uh, SSM banks. I have a question up here in front, please. 
Markus Zydra, die Deutsche Zeitung. Uh, a more general question, maybe, to the both of you, basically. The mandate of the ECB is very clear. It says price, maintaining price stability comes first. So the question is, is it fair to assume that banking supervision comes second for the ECB? Shall I start? Start. As I'm <laughs> the master of separation, <laughs> being in both, being in being in in in, in both areas, um, we do have clear objectives on the central bank uh, side with, an, as you mentioned, maintaining uh, price stability and totally independent, totally separated from this. So there is no hierarchy. Yeah? Um, there is our objective in the SSM to contribute to a safe and sound banking system to work for the customers um, of the banks uh, to ensure that we have a functioning banking system. So um, there is no first and no second, as these are separate um, objectives um, done um, by different staff um, prepared in the decision with a very um, protecting rule framework around it um, um, in the decision making, um, separated with regard to the information flows and the decision pre uh, preparing. So for me, no first and second, but uh, totally in parallel and in separate um, objectives which we have to fulfill. Question? Yeah, in the second row then? Oh, okay, then we'll take that first and then you yeah, after that. Uh, Boris Gründer from Bloomberg, Bloomberg News. Um, the commission uh, document that you referred to makes a very concrete proposal um, when it comes to the SREP process. It proposes to split the, um, the capital add-on that is uh, decided on the SREP into a um, a mandatory um, requirement and a guidance, as they call it. Is that a distinction or a split um, that would make sense in your SREP methodology? Is that something you could um, think of adopting? Or what's, what are your thoughts about that possible, um, which is similar to what the Bank of England um, is doing? Uh, and secondly, you were saying, uh, Madame Nui, that um, the rising spreads on some instruments were showing that investors were waking up to the new reality. Th those are my words now. But so, are you saying that the developments we saw on the um, on the uh, cocoa market in the first two months of the year were actually not a big surprise, or are they the new normal? Well, uh, the, 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 there is a, a link between the, the, the two questions, as a matter of fact. Uh, well, yes, the paper from the Commission makes a difference uh, between pillar two requirement and pillar two guidance. Uh, it may be useful, uh, frankly, to, to address the, the problems that uh, raise from the implementation of the, the directive on CRR, the, the stacking order of the different buffers, uh, and also the, the, the point where uh, maximum distribution amount uh, uh, is uh, getting effect. Uh, so, uh, yes, we think that it may be useful and we will uh, consider how to uh, implement it. This is the kind of uh, working progress that we are uh, having now regarding the, the SREP. Uh, indeed, uh, I, I believe that the, the investors are uh, gradually uh, taking into consideration the, the, new, uh, the new world, the new uh, uh, post-BRD uh, uh, directive implementation, full implementation, the new bailing world, uh, and they, they don't like uh, uncertainty, the, the investors and the markets, and if they feel that uh, they are in a situation uh, with uncertainty, they, they hit the, the, the banks for that. So that's why we uh, absolutely need to deliver uh, certainty, clarity, transparency to the market on uh, pillar two, on the way it is uh, calculated, uh, and on the maximum uh, distribution uh, amount. On these two, we have uh, requested the clarification to the commission. And I would even go further, I think, uh, uh, 
clarity regarding the uh, maximum distribution amount uh, on top of the clarification already received should be in, uh, in legislation to provide full clarity and transparency to the markets. So now we had a question in the second row here. Up front here, please. Thank you, Niels Bühnemann, TV2 Denmark. Uh, so uh, quite recently there was a case in uh, Latvia, I think, if I'm not mistaken, uh, where the ECB ordered the closing of a small bank. Uh, I'm not quite sure if this was the first time you took such an enforcement action, but if it was, uh, maybe you could give a little bit of flavor to, as to how that came about. It was, okay, did the initiative come from the ECB itself or from the national supervisor? And if it was not the first time, uh, could you maybe mention the number of similar cases, if there had been some uh, in, the, in the past? And, and uh, let's say, what is the, what is the generic uh, type of, of action that you would take in such cases? Okay. Well, uh, we, we won't comment on single banks. As you know, we do have confidentiality rules with regard uh, to the specific cases of, of, of single banks, so we cannot go into the detail of one bank. But I can give you some generic um, idea. No, it was not the first time that we withdraw a license. Yeah? And this is exactly the process we have with regard to small banks. Yeah? The less significant ones, as I mentioned in, in my introductory statements, are supervised, directly supervised by the national competent authorities. Um, but the question of who gets a license and is a license withdrawn under certain circumstances is something what is answered here and is done here. When do you do this? You do this in general when the national competent authority asks you and applies for withdrawal of the license because the national competent authority as being the one in charge for the less significant ones uh, um, tells you as ECB, um, they do not fulfill certain capital requirements. Um, um, there are other issues um, which, um, um, uh, which justifies, which makes it necessary to withdraw a license. And uh, that was the case with the bank um, uh, you were mentioning. It was not the first time that we did this with regard to less significant uh, banks. Um, we had some Italian cases for example. Um, so um, this is a, a way of dealing with small banks who either go um, into um, insolvency or where they go via a bridge bank to a new owner. There you have always the question of what do you do with the old license? Do you need a new license for the bridge bank, etc.? And this is done here with us. So let's move over here. Um, the, the gentleman in the third row there is. Uh, Thomas Seidel, Luxembourg Award. Um, yesterday, the German finance minister, uh, Dr. Schäuble, introduced to his audience a um, kind of uh, regulation for small banks. He called it small banking box. Uh, can you? Tell us something about uh, details. What is going on in the European uh, Union? Uh, how will such a small banking box look alike? I'm, I'm really sorry. Um, um, do you know a little bit more what he meant with a small banking box? <laughs> can you give me a little bit more detail and then perhaps with other keywords yeah, he, I can... Yeah, <laughs> he told... Um, um, in his speech all about regulation and um, the efforts uh, of the regulation, of the new regulation. And uh, when it comes to the question, uh, what is the burden for smaller ah. banks, yeah? Oh, uh, yes. He yes. Okay. told us they will, they will come up with a small banking box, yeah? Okay, now I know what you um, uh, perhaps probably. I mean, I'm not in charge of Mr. Schäuble and commenting um, and interpreting his words, yeah? Uh, but I can imagine, I assume, that it is the ongoing discussion which we had for 20 years now, whether 
um, uh, there should be in regulation a difference between the international active banks and um, the small uh, and medium-sized banks, which are only regional, active, and uh, which more or less do not have um, interconnectedness, cross-border, which do not uh, have investment banking, etc. And it was always discussed in um, Germany, as we have so many small banks, uh, um, whether it is totally justified um, to take the same regulation for the small banks um, than the, the big ones. And it comes up always with the Basel Committee because the Basel Committee does standards for international active banks. And there are many countries which uh, only take these standards for the big ones, US America, for example. They um, um, uh, ask only the big ones uh, to comply with the Basel um, standards. And then they have an own rule set, an own rule box for the small ones. Um, and we are always, when we are on the Basel Committee, um, we are always discussing then and saying as a European uh, representative, you know, my, my French, my Dutch, my Italian colleagues and, and myself, we always um, um, ensure that um, um, in the Basel Committee, uh, the people acknowledge that what we are talking about and what we are proposing as rules is not only valid for the big ones, but that has to fit too with a certain kind of proportionality, with a certain kind of you know, um, um, uh, justification to the small ones too. And it might be um, uh, that uh, Mr. Schäuble um, uh, took this up again and asked himself whether there should be a separate, a different rule box uh, for the small ones. If I may add something, uh, I would like uh, to say that uh, I think uh, the best way forward is uh, a single uh, regulation implementing, uh, implemented with proportionality. And proportionality is a magic word. Proportionality should be always, on a magic tool, should be always used. But I doubt personally that uh, to have two sets of rules when the two categories of banks are competing together domestically would do uh, any good to the small bank. Uh, they, they are probably better off being in the same uh, single European regulatory framework, but uh, it has to be implemented uh, with proportionality. And I am under a tough scrutiny from the Europa European Parliament on this. I got the question several times yesterday in the European Parliament. Are you uh, demonstrating enough proportionality? I think this is where we have to be convincing. I totally join, and I think so too. It's very, I mean, we discussed this for 20 years in Germany. Uh, and I think it's very difficult where to put the threshold. When is a bank important enough yeah, um, uh, to justify different rules? And what kind of competition questions do you get in a single market, in, in, you know, in a country where um, the saving banks compete um, uh, with uh, the big ones, um, especially in Germany, um, with regard to retail customers, corporate uh, clients, etc., it's it's a very it's it's a very difficult question to really do two different um, sets of regulation. And yes, proportionality is at the end what we try to do, and I think where we both succeeded because we always mm -hmm. sat next to each other in the Basel Committee, you know, yeah. for the for ten years, yeah. France um, and Germany. France and Germany, exactly. FG. I think I think where we really succeeded is that. Um, we, we, we put enough wording and phrasing in the Basel uh, standards that you uh, can apply proportionality and can more or less uh, justify differences. Yeah. It's a little bit like with the minimum requirements of risk management um, in, in Germany, where, where you more or less say stricter standards, much higher standards need to take into account. The big ones and the smaller ones are burdened less. Yeah but have the framework the same, you know, the pillars, the key features are the same. We have a question here in the, in the front, and then we'll go to the middle. Yeah. 
Oh, no, wait, sorry, the gentleman in front. Oh, merci. <laughs> Thank you. Two questions, please. Um, here in Germany, there is not only a strong critic, criticism on the monetary policy stance, but also there is a strong resistance against a European guarantee scheme project, which would be the third pillar of the banking union. So my question is how um, optimistic are you that it is possible to circumvent this German opposition uh, to the project and or uh, it is better to leave it uh, for the uh, 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 next future when other conditions maybe are fulfilled. Um, and second question, in the press there are some reports regarding the so-called CUM-X dividend schemes, a quite complicated issue involving a lot of financial actors, among them possibly uh, banks under your scrutiny. Um, so I wanted to ask do you have an eye on this CUM-X uh, topic, which is quite a German issue, I guess? Um, and, and more generally, how do you handle with uh, those kinds of legal risks? Is it something uh, uh, that is on, on your duty? Thank you. I will start with uh, Edis and uh, a couple of general sentences on uh, conduct risk, but uh, I will let uh, Sabine comment uh, this uh, COMEX uh, scheme uh, that I know uh, less than uh, obviously. Uh, well, let me say that uh, we welcome the European Commission proposal for deposit guarantee scheme uh, because this uh, third pillar is the missing pillar of the banking union and uh, we, we need to have it uh, coming uh, gradually. Uh, it is important also for us that bank contributions to deposit uh, insurance funds uh, are risk-based compared to all banks in the banking union and not only uh, to national peers. Uh, I know that uh, my German colleagues uh, are also uh, quite uh, keen on the risk reduction uh, before moving uh, to risk sharing. Uh, personally, I believe that uh, risk sharing and risk uh, reduction uh, have to take place uh, in parallel. Uh, an appropriate uh, phasing of a fully fledged uh, EDIS, uh, the deposit European Deposit Guarantee Scheme, is necessary uh, to take into account uh, the different starting positions of national deposit guarantee scheme. Uh, so such uh, phasing in will also allow uh, making further progress uh, to level the playing field in the banking union and to further reduce uh, risk in the banking sector. So, uh, again, risk reduction and risk sharing are mutually reinforcing elements to strengthen the banking union and uh, should be, they should not be uh, preconditioned, they should move uh, together. Uh, regarding uh, the, the, the second part of the question, I understand that uh, this is uh, about uh, conduct risk, which is obviously a matter of uh, concern for uh, supervisors, and we uh, are making sure that uh, uh, the governance in the banks, the internal control uh, of the bank, including the, the, the control of uh, conduct risk, is uh, appropriate. But uh, I will let uh, Sabine be more precise in the, the response. Well, um, it's a very German response. Huh? We are not in charge of conduct risk. Uh, that's about Buffett's work. Yeah, but, but, yeah, but. Um, we have to take up um, the results of the investigation of the prosecutor, the results of um, the findings um, of Buffett, and have to ask then, um, ourselves, what does this, what kind of impression and what kind of assessment do we then have with regard to governance and risk management and what kind of impact with regard uh, to the capital, yeah, with regard to litigation um, uh, cost will come to the banks out of it. So we are more or less in the, what I call second layer. Yeah? Um, um, of work. So first we have to see what comes out of this investigation and then we will um, um, act and assess um, these outcomes. So what do we do now? We observe this uh, closely and, and co comprehensively um, and, and then we will see um, um, 
what kind of impacts um, this um, has um, for the banks. But it's not yet our turn. Huh? Perhaps next year's uh, annual press conference. Huh? And we had a question right here in the middle on the third, in third row, please. Thank you. Gerardo Graziola with Radio Core News Agency. Madame Nuyi, assuming that the first merger between two bank, Italian banks will be successful, which is your vision of the Italian banking system in the next three, four years, for instance? Well, uh, as Sabine, I, I don't look at banking systems, frankly. Uh, I, I know about a single banking system, which is the SSM banking system, with different kinds of banks, different uh, kinds of, uh, of situations. Uh, we believe, uh, and this is the objective we have received, the, the, the two of us from the, the parliament that has uh, approved uh, our nomination, uh, the, the, the objective of uh, making sure that banks are safe and sound, uh, and safer and sound after the, 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 the crisis that they, they, they went through. So uh, we know that a number of developments have to take place. Uh, and for example, in countries uh, where uh, the banking system is not uh, very concentrated or not enough concentrated, uh, mergers are uh, desirable. And this is my understanding of the legal steps that have been taken by the Italian government uh, to uh, make this uh, important reform of the Populare banks. It's to uh, give them uh, more capacity to as address the challenges of the, the current times, and also to, to be able to have uh, such uh, mergers uh, when it is helpful. And indeed, Italy is one of the countries where there is room for uh, mergers uh, in order to have uh, more profitable banks, uh, more sustainable business uh, models. Uh, so uh, my vision of the, the SSM banks uh, in, the, in the future, let's say, for example, in two and a half years, uh, when my mandate uh, will end up, uh, is to uh, deliver uh, for the SSM and also for the, the Italian banking system, for sure, safer and sounder uh, banks, thanks to the, the, the good work that we are doing with our Italian colleagues to reach uh, this objective. And as I, I mean, uh, may, may I add, I, I think it is a, it's, it's a very good perspective to look into the medium and in, into the long term. Yeah, um, not only with regard, you know, short-term crisis management, but to have a kind of vision. What does it need to have a safe and sound bank? What does it need to ensure that um, uh, the wealth of um, the customers in in the SSM, cust banks customers in the SSM. Um, um, you know that that this is safe, yeah? um, and and here uh, we need to have uh, banks with a viable business model, um, especially when they are big banks with a sound capital basis, yeah? in order uh, to cope with potential um, adverse scenario uh, for a longer time period. Put a question here in the second row, AFP, please. Uh, good morning, Benoit Toussaint, Agence France Presse. Uh, two questions for me, one on Italy. Uh, quick follow-up from the previous question. Um, some Italian agencies reported yesterday that the ECB gave its green light to the merger between the two banks and uh, some other uh, agencies reported that the ECB asked only for further clar clarifications. Could you please give us an idea of uh, the state of discussions? Where are you satisfied with uh, what the banks announced? And where do you see still some room for improvement? And a second question on uh, interest rates. Um, Mr. Pratt said uh, last week that the interest rates of the ECB could still go f um, lower. Um, I would like to know if you have a better idea now on the threshold on which uh, it would be unbearable for, for banks, even if they adjust their business models and they work on their yeah, business models. Regarding the, the, merger, the Italian uh, merger, I will not uh, comment the situation regarding uh, individual banks. I will uh, just uh, tell you that uh, uh, mergers are delicate operations uh, for banks. Uh, we all know, I am sure, uh, mergers that uh, in the past uh, made in 
all the countries, uh, not uh, Italian uh, specifically, uh, banks uh, weaker than they were before a merger. So we want to make sure uh, for all mergers that uh, the new entity is strong uh, from the very beginning. On, in the present case, we are talking about a bank that would be the third Italian bank. So it's uh, quite uh, important and significant to make it successful, uh, to have a successful uh, merger. Uh, this being said, uh, I understand also through the Italian newspaper that are uh, speaking a lot about uh, this, this operation that uh, uh, the conditions that we have put that would have been exactly the same for any bank in any uh, country of the SSM have been understood by the Italian uh, banks and authorities and that they will be complied with. So it seems that uh, quite fast now uh, there will be possibly, if I am well informed through uh, what I read, uh, and I believe I am, the things will, pro, uh, will, um, will move. Let's wait until they really move to declare that. Is it? On your interest rate? Yes, on the sorry, yes, Shall I? Yes. No, no problem it was with, so much with for regard you, to the. That I no, no, <laughs> <just> no. <laughs> um, where's the threshold? Well, I mean, you always can go lower. Yeah? Uh, I would not. Um, I, I, we have other, uh, the other way around. I mean, we are here in the SSM talking about banking supervision and not so much about low interest rate and what kind of monetary policy instruments are there. They can always go lower, but you have to um, balance between the costs and the benefits of monetary policy measures. Might they be standard monetary policy measures or non-standard ma monetary po policy measures? And um, But this is my personal opinion, uh, one um, might doubt about uh, the balances if, if you were to go lower. Um, but as I said, this is my personal um, opinion, um, and, and, and it might not be um, uh, the opinion of the governing uh, council. Yeah? So looking into um, the cost-benefit analysis, the side effects, the question of what kind of risks um, do come with what kind of measures is a very important issue. And then for me, very important is too, if the conditions change, if the macroeconomic environment change, when growth is coming back yeah, um, in a um, sufficient manner, um, to go out as fast as possible yeah, when the conditions are met is um, the most important thing. So you can count on me that I will be the first one yeah, um, asking uh, for an exit uh, when uh, the conditions are changing. There's a question uh, by Yasmin Osman in the back, yeah, and then further up. Thank you. Um, I had, I had uh, two questions uh, to the uh, commission note or proposal to the Pillar 2 requirements. Um, if you uh, use this proposal, so um, what share of the SREP surcharge, surcharge or add-on um, you impose now would be in the guidance part and what in the requirements part? Uh, so um, how would the MDA develop if you would use the, or follow those proposals? And um, what value uh, will, will the guidance part of a SREP add-on have uh, if it doesn't limit banks' ability uh, to pay dividends uh, or bonuses or cocoa bonds? So isn't it very uh, useless if banks don't have to fulfill it to pay any dividends? Well, uh, very easy to respond to you because this is work in progress. I have no response yet when we have uh, responses, when we have uh, had a chance to discuss it in the supervisory board, uh, we will uh, inform you. Okay. You know this note, I mean, just, just to add this note, um, um, is a working paper yeah, uh, which was sent to us because we asked for clarification um, on uh, the stacking order, et cetera. 
um, as there seems to be different approaches in the European Union, not in the SSM. In, in the SSM, we harmonized uh, with the SREP, but there are different approaches in the European Union, so we ask for it. Um, now we got a working uh, paper back with the request, um, uh, please tell us where do you st see still need for clarification, uh, what is your opinion, etc. And as um, um, Danielle said, it's work in progress. Um, uh, we do not have yet a draft answer um, uh, to this um, uh, note. Um, as it, it came, um, I think last week, it came last week, um, and we are still uh, making a list of questions, you know, um, uh, for the Commission too. So a little bit too early, your question, but a very good one. <laughs> so the gentleman to rose up, yeah. Good morning, Luca Davi, for El Sole 24 Ore. Um, two questions about the consolidation process that uh, we hope is going to, to start. Uh, first of all, um, as far uh, as we, are, we understood, um, the SSM wants to receive a business plan when two different uh, uh, banks are going to, uh, to merge. Uh, is it possible that um, the SSM board could give the his preliminary approval to the merger before or even without having all the de all details about a business plan that is due to arrive, uh, but that just knowing the main details about uh, capital actions or, uh, or governance. Second question is about the capital actions that apparently you are going to, to ask to one of these two banks involved in Italy in, in this possible merger. Uh, do you think that these uh, actions could be considered as a benchmark for, for the future, for next mergers in, 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 in an SSM uh, framework? Thank you. Well, uh, it's interesting, the, the SSM, because uh, the cultural differences uh, are popping up from time to time. Uh, coming from my uh, former capacity, the, the very first thing that uh, banks would put on the table when discussing a merger would be a business plan of uh, the new entity uh, before everything else. But I have been explained by my uh, Italian colleagues that it's not the way it's done in Italy, in Italy so far, and that uh, it, it comes uh, a bit later. So granted, we, to, we took that. Uh, the supervisory board asked for a business plan and still wants to uh, receive one, but it's not a precondition for uh, moving forward uh, on the, the discussions. And this is uh, what we are uh, doing. Uh, so yes, probably uh, there will be a response before uh, receiving uh, this, uh, this business plan. Uh, regarding uh, capital actions that uh, we are uh, asking from the banks, again, uh, we are asking to those banks exactly what we would be asking to any other SSM bank in any other countries provided it presents the same size and same risk profile. For example, uh, we don't ask the same thing to a future third bank in the big country that is uh, Italy, uh, that we would require from a merger uh, creating the 15th uh, largest bank in, in Italy. Uh, uh, obviously, uh, the, the bigger the bank, the most important it is for the, the SSM and for the Italian uh, banking system that was mentioned earlier. Uh, so uh, the, 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 it's a case-by-case -case basis uh, outcome of the implementation of the, the, the same criteria. Uh, so that's the that's the, the, the situation. We uh, compare the, the, the possible future third uh, Italian banking bank with the uh, Italian banks and SSM banks that are in the same situation, but mostly uh, Italian banks. 
So watching the time, we have about time for one more question. Yes, in the back there, please. Balash Karani from Reuters. A couple of questions. Um, what can and should the ECB do to expedite the resolution of NPRs? And, and Madam Nui, you, you mentioned yesterday that it will take years to get the NPRs uh, to a reasonable level. Could you venture a guess? You know, how many years are you talking about? The second question is, is a somewhat theoretical question about settlement of, of euro derivative trade. Um, do you think it is appropriate for such trade to be settled outside the European Union? Currently, it is settled inside the EU, but should, should things change, would it be appropriate to be for settlement outside the EU? Well, uh, regarding non-performing exposures, uh, we have quite diverse uh, situations in Europe. It's not a problem in all countries of uh, the SSM, for example. And when we consider the, the countries that face this issue, uh, there are different situations based on the uh, loans themselves. Are there loans to retailers, mortgages, for example, or are there loans to SMEs or loans to big corporate? Also, differences are uh, what is the, the situation of the uh, legal and judicial system in the country? Uh, how, uh, how long it takes to repossess collateral when you uh, try to recover the, 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 the loan. Uh, so how long it takes will depend on these uh, circumstances, uh, obviously. But at the end of the day, it's uh, still always the, 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 the same uh, solutions. First of all, when you, we have a problem of this magnitude, uh, we need to use all kinds of tools, all the tools that uh, are available, and all the, the good advice and good support that uh, we could receive. For example, we work with the IMF uh, on this issue of non-performing exposure because there is a lot of expertise uh, in the IMF regarding uh, th this issue. Uh, and also, the situation is always the, the, the same because it means uh, to uh, fix objectives uh, to banks to review their portfolios, to sort out uh, the, the portfolios between uh, the loans that can be uh, restructured and that uh, will uh, become uh, performing again, and the, the loans uh, that um, will not, uh, that has already been restructured or cannot be restructured uh, and transformed into uh, performing loans and have to be uh, considered as uh, default, uh, default loans. Uh, so uh, obviously, uh, de depending of the, the magnitude of the problem, it may take uh, more years for certain countries. But this being said, uh, let me remind you that this is uh, precisely why uh, we had this asset quality review, uh, comprehensive assessment in the beginning of the uh, SSM. Uh, we use, uh, for the first time, a single definition of non-performing exposure, which was a big step in the good direction. And we have identified now the, the non-performing exposures uh, in all countries using the, the, the same definition. Uh, we have uh, reviewed the valuation of those assets, and we have asked for provisions, uh, all the possible accounting provisions. And when the accounting system was not permitting to have such additional provisions, we had asked for prudential provisions. Uh, so uh, we are uh, in good shape uh, on this uh, ground, having identified the problem and having uh, reasonable level of provision uh, to take the needed time to, to make it uh, a success. Uh, obviously, uh, the, the, when the, the problem is of little magnitude, it will be uh, fixed fast. When it is uh, bigger, it will take a, a bit more time. But uh, as I say quite often, when you have a long journey to do, you have to start uh, as early as possible. This is what we have done. And uh, be very committed. And through the, the working group that we have established, shared by uh, an Irish uh, deputy governor, uh, lady deputy governor of the Irish Central Bank, because uh, we use the best uh, supervisory practices on this country, Ireland has done a good job with the non-performing exposures. We are uh, moving in the, 
in the right direction and uh, with a lot of momentum. I am all, uh, I'm surprised of what uh, is achieved by uh, the, the, the starting of this uh, journey. Oh, the derivative. Do you want to, uh, to respond? Yeah, I, I mean, when you are talking about settlement of um, uh, derivatives um, inside or outside of the euro area, one European Union, yes. Is there a hint on 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 the discussion of the <laughs> referendum? Um, um, are you because possibly? Huh? I thought so. <laughs> Without saying, well, I mean, uh, we have to see what uh, comes out of the referendum on the 23rd of June, and then we will discuss what kind of uh, location policy is needed or not. So this is a question which comes a little bit too early. Okay, thank you very much for coming. We're closing the press conference here. Thank you. Bye.